Okay, our next speaker is Jen Toy. Jen, where are you? Okay, I see you. You're gonna have to make your way up here eventually. Come on up. Jen is a landscape architect and she is leader of test plots. She's gonna share her projects with us. Jen, do you wanna hold the mic or you want me to put it up here for you? Um, you wanna hide behind the lectern? Good idea. Thank you so much. I'm very thankful to be here um, and excited to share my work with test plots. Test plots are experimental restoration gardens on public lands that volunteers steward themselves over time from the initial planting through establishment and beyond. Um, our little manifesto is that uh, we believe in the incredible power of forming community around and with plants, and we believe that our ecological and climate, climate crises require a repairing of our kinship with our lands, a return to the commons and to care. We started four years ago with one modest little planting experiment in one park, and we've grown to nine different plots in California. Um, we're primarily working in LA on Gabrielino Tongva land and just started one plot up in San Bruno Mountain in Daly City, which is Rama Tishaloni land. Um, I, a recent transplant, I just moved up last year um, to the Bay Area from LA. More recently, we're even helping others start their own test plot spinoffs in Minnesota, Rhode Island, and even the Netherlands. So um, if you're interested, please come have a chat. I wanted to start with one of my favorite landscapes, the beautiful coastal sage scrub. Um, the colors are amazing, that low light, the smell of the sage when you brush by, um, that's really the kind of smell that reminds me of home. It's also an extremely fragile and threatened habitat. When you overlay the historic range, you'll see that most of the population of California also lives in that same area, which is in the bottom there. But in contrast to that really glorious image, the reality is that our home landscapes more often than not look like this. Disturbed patches of grasses from all over the world and monocultures of black mustard. There's a term um, used to describe this, no this um, landscape, novel ecosystems. They exist in places that have been altered in structure and function. The management requires a balance between ecological restoration and the recognition of the value of these altered systems in a changing world. So starting to address these novel ecosystems has been one of the um, interests that we've had with Test Plot. Um, we've been working on our plots um, really focused in these novel ecosystems because one, they're so omnipresent. They basically define urban ecology nowadays. Um, they exist where people live. Um, and then there's also secondly, real questions about how we actually manage these landscapes. Um, for example, like the eucalyptus forest up here or down in LA, um, the hilltops that are sort of covered with these European grasses and mustard, castor bean, tree of heaven um, that you often find on former grazing lands. Um, here, I wanted to just acknowledge the important connection between these landscapes and their communities. Um, as we all know, it's really not a coincidence that neglected, mismanaged lands are often found in underinvested, low-income neighborhoods. Um, and there's a lot to say on this topic, but um, the way that Elva Yanas, who is wearing the Save Elephant Hill t-shirt, um, put it to me was that Elephant Hill, which is where this plot is located, would just look a lot different if it were in Bel Air rather than in El Sereno. Which brings me to this sort of larger systemic issue, um, the devaluation of labor and maintenance in our culture. I think California is doing a lot of great things, moving in the right direction, conserving land through 30 by 30, funding nature-based solutions, yet there still exists this fascination with low or no maintenance landscapes. And for me, I think that's just tragic. Um, 
in this article, I just highlight it because the reporter is praising these green infrastructure or eco architecture projects, as he calls them, um, that are being built in LA. But he says there's a quote danger that a big chunk of the bond money will be ultimately spent on upkeep, you know, as if that's a bad thing and a waste of taxpayer money. And in fact, we know that this way of thinking goes way back. While droughts and floods um, are a normal part in fire, are, no are a normal part of our coastal sage and chaparral ecosystem, um, the effects really have been exacerbated by the eradication of um, indigenous land management practices. This is an incredible book if you haven't read it, Tending the Wild. Um, so basically, we feel like there's a huge opportunity to shift the culture back towards care, specifically care of the commons. I'm gonna share some of our guiding principles, um, give you an overview of our process, and then conclude by highlighting um, some of our approaches to community-based stewardship. Um, I'm not gonna read all of them, but I wanted to highlight a few that hopefully will resonate with this audience. Um, first, to bring back beauty and biodiversity. Um, really can't overstate the power of beauty and, and what we're doing as a way to connect to people, as a way for folks to connect to the land, also the sort of beauty of creating something together. Um, the land needs laborers. Um, we really want Tesla to be a celebration of labor, really against that idea of a, a low or no, no maintenance landscape. Closed loops, in terms of water, materials, seeds, we're trying to promote local genetics when possible. Um, and then experimentation. Um, there's always this test and test plot that's, that's in the name of our organization um, because uh, we want it to be about asking questions and trying new things and getting folks involved. Lastly, um, diverse land ethics, to honor and learn about the diversity of land ethics that exist and to really think broadly about ways to connect to, connect to and respect the land. Um, how are we structured? Um, we're pretty new. We started about three years ago. Um, and uh, we're an organization, but we're still awaiting nonprofit status. Um, we partner with land managers um, as well as residents. And um, in some of the plots, it's been as informal as a handshake. Um, in other plots, we will sign an MOU or get a license agreement to get permission to take care of the land. Um, there's different permutations of who takes the lead depending on the plot, um, but um, funding has come from academia, uh, University of Southern California where I teach in the Department of Architecture, um, as well as um, different firms that we partner with like Terremoto and Saturate California um, and grant funding. So in terms of our process, whoops. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of our process, um, sorry. Um, finding the right site. Um, as I mentioned, there are these novel ecosystems and we really look for these types of opportunities to work because it allows us to experiment in this gray zone between ecological restoration and this sort of native gardening stewardship laboratory um, in ways that maybe are not as permissible in traditional capital C conservation land. The plots start out, start out fairly contained. They're usually about five to 10,000 square feet in a larger public landscape. Um, and keep in mind, you know, our oldest test plot is just three years old, so we're definitely still learning and evolving, listening. Um, having a public water source um, can also be critical especially in SoCal. Um, at this plot, the design was driven by the location of a lone hose bib in Elysian Park. Um, you can see the little black mark and the four green circles were basically as far as we could stretch a hose. 
um, the circle form it just came out of the the radius of the sprinkler. Um, so it was very a simple and pragmatic approach, but it turned out to be this also very beautiful and clear form. In terms of design, I'm a landscape architect. We definitely have a whole sort of process um, when we're coming up with the designs of the plots. But just to highlight one aspect, um, we found that these like rolled cedar fences are very useful because they really help people notice that we're doing something. Um, it becomes this kind of visual cue of care um, that something's happening. And here, in contrast to the circle, we tried a slightly different approach where the fences became these lines to mark the plots. Um, and as opposed to boundaries, because we wanted them to be very, um, we wanted to encourage wandering, and we wanted the plots to be very welcoming um, and to let people to know that there's a space for them. Um, there is always a robust weed seed bank, so we've taken several approaches to site preparation. Um, one of the common ones um, is when there is water source and when the, there's loose soils, um, we'll do a grow kill cycle of water weed, water weed, um, and then by hand removal, and then host a weeding party, which people love. Um, when there's no public water source, we've also tried solarization and sheet mulching. Um, and then we always host community planting days. And um, the goal is to really reach a cross section of neighbors that include folks that maybe don't already volunteer who aren't already um, involved in their local public space um, that can serve as a basis for building an ongoing community leadership group. Because that initial planting day is really just the beginning. Um, we try and do sequential multi-year planting because we're working with the seasons, with the cycles of drought, um, and we have to be able to be flexible and agile in when we do plantings, when, when we host work days. Um, so in that first year, we really focus on depleting the weed seed bank and supporting what's doing well on the site um, and take this approach of establishing early fast adapters. In the second year, Overseeding with wildflowers, sometimes grasses, to build back the soil mycorrhizal relationships. And then year three and beyond, um, adding in target species and expanding the boundaries of the plots. One way that we've been experimenting with expanding the boundaries is this idea of bringing um, uh, urban super bloom. Um, we're going to really try it in earnest this coming winter. Uh, but last year we did a trial um, at Elysian Park in LA and it was kind of very cool because it was just improvised on site by volunteers. We had some leftover seed and they scythed the early mustard down to create this kind of pathway which they marked with the little posts um, and then they just seeded after a good rain. And by summer it looked like this. So we called it the Rainbow River um, which you can see in the drone photo. Um, and it was kind of incredible because first it was an incredible year for Clarkia. Um, and then there were hundreds, maybe like thousands of caterpillars all over the flowers. And they were mainly um, white sphinx, white line sphinx moths, the hummingbird moths. They're enormous. Um, and it's, it's kind of this cool like novel ecosystem story because initially you can see how that path um, of wildflowers is like protected within the mustard. But then um, uh, the fire clearance crew came um, through from LA Rec and Parks and mowed down the mustard and then they kind of revealed this Rainbow River, which was great for taking photos. But the next day, all of the caterpillars were gone. And we were like, what happened? This is crazy. Um, I don't know if it was because of the noise or the disturbance or maybe the birds then could like swooped in. That's what I'm telling myself. Um, but it's this like novel ecosystem story where the mustard is actually protecting this wildflower. And then, I don't know, so the evil mustard was maybe doing something good in that case. <laughs> Um, monitoring is, is an important of the ongoing, is an important part of the ongoing work. Um, from taking simple time lapse photos to show changes over time. This one's at Baldwin Hills. Um, to conducting interviews and surveys with our stewards, which we capture in an online log. 
um, to um, honing in on what quantitative metrics are important and useful to track. Uh, we also love analog, so we try and make print publications to share back what we're learning. The zine on the left is called One Year in Land Care, a Practice Guide. Um, I brought a few copies um, for you all, so please come and check it out. Um, so that's kind of the test plot process very quickly. Um, in this last section, I'm just gonna talk for a few minutes about um, what we mean when we say community-based stewardship. Um, the main theme is that we really try and just take a very expansive and inclusive approach. Um, you know, the best thing is when people actually show up. <laughs> uh, so um, this was actually kind of the first test and test plot, will people even come? And um, Dante and Anthony were some of those um, stewards and they've now been working with us for the three, last three years. Um, this is what they say about volunteering with test plot. Anthony, for us, we were looking for an outlet to be outside. We love our apartment, but it's tiny. So we were looking for people with like values who are interested in the earth and planting in consideration of ecosystems. Dante, it's also about care. Because we've bonded to the land here, we have more of an investment in the plants and we want them to do well. It requires someone to give their time and you know that's valuable. I think that's been a common theme in what makes Test Plot special is that um, the folks who are working with us come back time and time again. You know, it's not just a one-time beach cleanup. It's something where they can start to take ownership over. And we really try to do a lot to support this feeling of ownership with our volunteers, um, setting up schedules so that people like Dante and Anthony can kind of drop by on their own schedule and really supporting this kind of cultural learning and experimentation like you saw with the Rainbow River. Um, we host an expansive range of programs and activities as well to invite more, invite more people in. Um, uh, here we harvested from the plots to host a workshop um, on a, we, uh, we harvested from the plots and hosted a workshop um, on a native plant dye technique called bundle or ecoprint dyeing. Um, on a larger scale, we even collaborated with a clothing company in LA called Older Brother to harvest the invasive mustard for their summer line, Pervasive Bloom. Um, so I thought I, this was really cool to me because it's like this lovely example of closed loops um, keeping materials out of the landfill and putting it towards a productive use. Um, and uh, we found also with our programming that there's a real hunger for learning more about regenerative practices. So we've started to use the plots as sources for seed and plant material to harvest from. Like this one where we collected and processed red elderberry seeds. Um, and then the way that we've brought in students and youth has been mainly so far with a partnership with USC where I teach. Um, each year we offer a test plot course that's open to both college and graduate students across the university. And in the neighborhoods, um, we reach out to local K through 12 schools around our plots. Um, for example, this is an example where we invited the Summit Chasta Environmental Club to attend our eucalyptus themed walk um, at San Bruno Mountain a few weeks ago. On the other end of the generational spectrum, um, we often partner with nonprofits or land managers that already have an existing volunteer base, um, often skewing slightly elderly. Um, and we try to use TESPLOT to kind of amplify their ongoing work. In this case, the Abuelas del Rio worked with our students to design the plot, um, and then they eventually took over the care of the plot once the students left. Um, in terms of increasing diversity and stewardship, um, we've been thinking a lot, there's a lot to say about that topic as well, but one thing to, to highlight here is that we've been thinking a lot about the question of like paid versus volunteer labor. Um, Aureli Perez is the site manager at this plot and she's a full-time paid employee by the nonprofit that manages the larger parklands in Baldwin Hills. And so we've been asking this question, should, we, should the work we've been doing through Test Plot 
simply be a privilege that folks who have some spare time can participate in, or should we be really focusing more on supporting paid physicians, apprenticeships, workforce development programs? Um, I think it's an interesting evolving conversation, but in general, we should be moving the needle towards the valuation of labor, both in terms of dollars and cents, as well as in terms of our societal value. Um, in this last example, I just wanted to share a project um, where we're sort of more actively working towards bringing disenfranchised groups into environmental stewardship. Um, in Daly City, which is a working class, predominantly Asian neighborhood, we heard stories about Filipino families that grew up in and around the mountain, but never ever went there. They never saw it as a place for them. Um, so for this project, we really actively looked for grants to support a, remote, a more robust community engagement process to develop a stewardship group that actually reflected the communities around the mountain. Um, Part of what we did there um, was that we invited Filipino students from the UC Berkeley Landscape Program to help lead that engagement. And we also awarded a fellowship to a woman named Victoria who grew up near the fountain. That's her lovely self-portrait. Um, so that work is really centered on going out into the neighborhoods um, and hosting workshops at places like the Daly City Community Center, um, trying to bring the mountain to them um, and to do things like exploring the relationship between culture and landscape in order to help folks make those connections um, to the landscape. As one quick example, on the right, a woman is describing the old joke that Daly City is so foggy because of all the steam from the Filipinos cooking their rice. <laughs> and then of course we do things like, um, we make sure to serve lumpia and star bread at our workshops. Uh, so to wrap up, um, yeah, that was kind of very fast, hope, hope that came through, but there's really one idea that I wanted to leave you with. Um, the U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, has been recently talking about the epidemic of loneliness and essentially how it is as bad as smoking for our health. Um, and his antidote to this crisis is that we need to rebuild the so social fabric of this country through social connections. A lot of people have been talking about that. Um, it's an idea that it's been a problem in our society for a long time. Um, Robert Putnam talked about this phenomenon in his book, Bowling Alone. Um, basically, post-World War II and the decline of civil society organizations um, in our society like church groups, PTA, bowling leagues. Um, and I really wanted to bring up this point because in many ways we see TESPA as a new kind of civil society organization. And I think probably many of you who lead stewardship groups um, are doing the same thing. And for us, the ability to spend that time together, spend that time with the land, building a set of practices and knowledge, creating something beautiful together has really been a way to create meaning and connection, not only with each other, but um, in terms of kinship with the land. Last slide, yep. So please um, check out our website, our log, Instagram. Thank you.